Pharma Shields. Uh, I'm the writing education specialist for Spokane Public Library. It's great to see you all here tonight. Um, so Spokane Public Library partnered with the Spokane Tribe of Indians to create the following land acknowledgement. All Spokane Public Library buildings sit on the traditional homelands of the four bands of the Spokane Tribe of Indians. The Upper Band, Middle Band, Lower Band, and Chihuahua Band. We show gratitude to the land, river, and peoples who have been fishing, hunting, harvesting, and gathering here for generations. May we learn from one another's stories so that we may nurture the relationship of the people of the Spokane tribe to all those who share this land. The presentation you are about to enjoy is part of Humanities Washington's Speakers Bureau program. Humanities Washington is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sparking conversation and critical thinking and it provides many other cultural programs to hundreds of thousands of people throughout Washington each year. I would encourage you to visit their website, www.humanities.org, to find other events like this one. Josh Teninga is an author, artist, and designer. After studying fine art at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, he founded an art and design agency where he continues to work as a creative director. His work has been published in the magazines Communication Arts and How Design. Tuninga is the author of the children's books Why Blue and Dream On, and Antes is selling all of the books today, um, including his new one, We Are Not Strangers, which is his first graphic novel. We are so elated to have you here today, Josh. I welcome you to the Liberty Park Library stage. Thank you, Thank you for, for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, cool. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. This is awesome. Um, it's really great to be here in Spokane. This is my first Humanities Washington talk that I'm going to be doing. So, um, yeah. So I definitely appreciate any feedback you can give me. You know, because I want to keep learning as I go. Um, that'd be really appreciated. Um, and before I get started, also I want to thank a couple people. So I want to thank Spokane Library and Sharma Shields for setting this up. I um, also want to thank the Asians for Collective Liberation Spokane uh, and Spokane Sequential for helping get the word out about the event and, of course, Auntie's Bookstore. Um, so, yeah, my name is Josh Taninga. I'm a graphic novelist from North Bend, Washington, and I'm here to talk about my favorite art form, which is comic books. Um, so, and to start things off, I'm just going to tell you a little story. Uh, so, a few years ago, um, I was at a Seattle bookstore uh, browsing my favorite section, and I was as I was busy scanning the shelves uh, for new releases, I overheard a mom talking to her middle school age son about um, who was holding a comic book. And she said, she walked up to him and said, that doesn't count as real reading. And I watched in agony as, he, as she placed the book back on the shelf and they both walked away. So since then I've thought about that moment quite a bit. It really, really bothered me. Uh, and it made me start asking some questions I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, so one is why are comics still perceived as a lower simpler form of art and number two is why do people value some forms of storytelling more than others so even though the graphic novel has earned countless prestigious awards and most schools are assigning graphic novels as court curriculum and there are even college degrees dedicated to the art form of Com making comics and cartooning. You can, either, you can actually get a master's uh, in comics at this point. Um, even with all you know, its accolades and popularity, there are many people who still consider comics as a rudimentary form of literature. Um, and for those who are okay with comics in the classroom, they may say something like, comics are a good way to get kids into real reading. Um, but rather than, you know, just a stepping stone into more traditional, valuable forms of literature, I want to have a presentation today that kind of presents comics as an important art form, you know, in its own right. So I'm going to present the graphic novel today as a way for artists to explore and experiment in ways that are not possible in other mediums and show how comics are, you know, just as capable of moving readers to examine and reflect on, you know, their own lives. Oh, and then I'm going to share a little bit about um, my own graphic novel and, and the stories that inspired it. So let's dive into the world of sequ sequential art. So um, the term sequential art is used in comic studies to describe comic strips, comic books, graphic novels, manga. 
and it's defined as an art form that presents images in a specific order for the purpose of graphic storytelling. Um, and so what does that mean? Put simply, it's you know, telling stories with images. Uh, most traditionally, comic books. But sequential art has been around you know, for a lo lot longer. To, you know, before the invention of comics, the, you know, sequential art has been around. Um, you know, telling stories with images is, you know, probably our earliest form of communication. Uh, hieroglyphics were a great way, you know, example of this. Um, you know, how people told, told stories with, um, you know, images, you know, about, you know, the gods and the afterlife using images in a sequence. Uh, the Greek and Roman empires um, used relief sculptures uh, to tell stories. This, to me, just looks not that different than a comic strip. In the Middle Ages, artists um, and writers commonly drew images alongside their written stories um, and letters. So the beginning of the comics uh, were happening simultaneously, you know, all over the world. Uh, who's here is familiar with manga? Everybody, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I go places and that's not the case, but it depends on the audience. Um, but for, if you're not familiar, you know, um, the word manga just translates from Japanese to comic. So manga are comics and graphic novels originating from Japan. Um, but the art form has you know, a real long his prehistory in early Japanese art. So origins can be found you know, in scrolls dating back from the 12th century. And as the art form kind of continued to evolve, it developed into what we call manga and comics today. And meanwhile, in America and Europe, the comic art form had evolved into what people think of today as you know, cartoon strips or the funnies. And in 1938, Superman made his first appearance in a comic book, which quickly was followed by countless other superhero comics. Um, and so this era was referred to as, by historians as the golden age of comics. Um, so comics were skyrocketing in popularity, selling millions of copies, and being read by people of like all ages. Um, but this popularity resulted in this kind of weird strong resistance among conservative voices. And in 1954, there was um, a dramatic shift in the industry that would kind of change comics forever. And that started with this book uh, by a psychiatrist named Dr. Wortham. And it's called The Seduction of the Innocent. And the book was accusing comic books as being responsible for juvenile delinquency in the United States at the time. And I claimed that comics were like really extremely dangerous for children, believe it or not. Uh, and believe it or not, the book was actually taken extremely seriously. Um, and it struck a chord with parents who wanted, you know, some censorship to happen. And this led to um, this US congressional inquiry into the comics industry. And it led to the formation of the Comics Code Authority. And so this was like essentially the parent, a parental advisory for comics that was happening at the time. Um, and so this censorship really kind of stunted any growth of comics that was happening in the United States at the time, uh, like crushed any of the innovation that was starting to happen. And so, you know, just at the point where comic books in America were really starting to grow and like become experimental, you know, they quickly became considered as, you know, disposable entertainment, you know. So while in other cultures like Japan and France, the UK, um, the art form of comics was like continuing to grow and thrive, in the U.S., comics was not becoming respected art form at all. It was, you know, considered the lowest form of literature there was. But eventually, there was, you know, some backlash against the comics code, and this resulted in underground creators making work that specifically went against, you know, those regulations of the mainstream industry. And so this created this kind of split in comics where, you know, one side being, you know, superhero comics, mainstream comics, and then on the other side there was like this diverse comic subculture starting to happen. And this led to the birth of the graphic novel. So written for older, you know, older audiences a little bit, um, deeper stories and subject matter, and um, yeah, this kind of changed the comics landscape dramatically. And now we have graphic novels, you know, appearing in every genre you can think of from fiction, memoir, sci-fi, historical fiction, you name it. We even have comic journalists now um, who travel and report stories through the art of comics. So this is the work of Joe Sacco, if you're not familiar, who um, 
he's credited as credited as the first um, artist to practice like investigated journalism through comics. And artists are able to collaborate with um, people to tell their stories. This is the March trilogy, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, autobiographical graphic novel uh, about the civil rights movement. Uh, told by U.S. Congressman Joe Lewis, um, who collaborated with Nate Powell to create this, um, you know, histor this story. So yeah, and you can still just dive into superhero and sci-fi action comic. This is Cowboy Bebop, which began as a manga comic uh, in the early 90s, and it um, soon after was made into this animated show, which is like acclaimed as one of the you know, greatest animated TV series of all time. So graphic novels, you know, in particular, they're, they've grown uh, into one of the most popular and fastest growing forms of literature in the world. Um, and as you can see, it's not letting up anytime soon. It's definitely exponential. Um, and, you know, even just the last couple of years, it's definitely even, it's even growing crazy amounts. Um, so the demand for these comics and graphic novels are so high that librarians are quoted as saying they just aren't able to keep them on the shelves. And comics and graphic novels uh, have become so influential that they are being adapted into like a lot of the most popular award-winning films of our time. Um, and it makes a lot of sense, you know, that they're being adapted this way because comics are inherently cinematic. So um, the pan panels of a comic book can feel, you know, like the storyboard outline for a movie. Um, this is an example of um, a comic called Heartstopper, which was made into a TV series. And as you can see, there are filming choices that are taken like directly from the story, which is pretty cool to see. Uh, but another reason uh, I think comics are being adapt adapted and converted into film so often is because comics and graphic novels tackle some of you know, the most important social issues of our time. So things like race, war, politics, economic issues, and social inequality. And then here are two of the most famous graphic novels of all time. Um, uh, Mouse by Art Spiegelman, which won the Pulitzer Prize, and Watchmen. Uh, Alan Moore, uh, which made it onto Time Magazine's top 100 novels of all time. It was only a comic book on there, but it's a start. So it's kind of a brief history of the art form of comics, which has evolved quite a bit since its roots. Uh, we've seen it grow from kind of this rudimentary form of storytelling into you know, this highly acclaimed art form. So why does the negative view of comics still persist? So I've been asking around and I've been talking to parents in my community, and I wanted to just share with you some of the reactions I've been getting um, and to kind of address those. So when I ask parents their concerns about comics in the classroom, one of the most common responses I hear is comic books don't challenge readers enough. And so, you know, it's a totally valid concern. We want our kids to become intelligent readers and, you know, people who can communicate ideas and think critically. It feels like if we just stick to the tried and true classics, you know, our kids will learn complex language skills and a larger vocab. Um, but, you know, I hate to break it to you, but that's just, you know, the data just doesn't support that. So professors at California State University conducted, conducted a study um, to analyze language used in different art forms, and they compared the vocab uh, content of adult books, children's books, television, and comics. And what they found is pretty interesting. So comic books ranked almost identical to adult books in the amount of rare words used. So per 1,000 words, comics provide readers with the same frequency of challenging, challenging words. So can, can, can comics make us better readers? Um, so Dan Hurley would definitely agree. Um, he's a science writer and journalist. Uh, who has written it you know, for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Washington Post, um, written several books. He's like really about as prolific of a writer as, you, as there is. And when he grew up in the 60s, he was labeled as a slow learner, as a, quote, dumb kid. He says he couldn't read a single word by the time he was eight years old. And so what do you think, all, what, what do you think changed all that? Comic books. So, so Hurley says that he and his friend discovered Spider-Man and before they knew it, they were kind of creating their own stories by themselves. And then he started reading, studying, getting straight A's, and the rest is history. So um, Hurley kind of credits 
you know, this is his quote, you know, by the extraordinary impact of Spider-Man by that great literary genius, Stan Lee. So it turns out that reaching for a comic book can actually challenge readers. So another common, common response I get when I ask parents what they think about comics is, comics are really only good for entertainment. They're so colorful and flashy, um, you know, how can, they just look like they're just way too much fun to be good for you. Um, but, you know, what do you think really makes comics so much fun? So I think this quote from Lucas Maxwell, a librarian um, and comics advocate from London sums it up. So he says, students who read comics do so for the peer-to-peer -peer engagement. This explains the ravenous approach to comic books borrowing I've seen. Teens are grabbing comics, reading them at lunch, and then returning them only to have their friend behind them asking to borrow it so they can all come back and discuss them. And so Maxwell's written at length about excitement he's seeing around comic books and, you know, in young readers, and I think he's absolutely right. So I teach a comic class in the high, at the high school in North Bend, Washington. And when my students are, you know, working, they're chatting with each other as they draw, and I hear their conversations and they're like, you know, they're talking about stories that they're listening, that they've been reading, debating about what's gonna happen next, and, um, you know, laughing about the stories. They're talking about the character motivations, and, you know, they're, they're literally just facilitating a book club in class while we're, while we're working. Um, and they're bringing their, these skills, like, into their own work, you know? So, um, you know, but many parents would still say, yeah, but it's still just recreational reading. Uh, but that's just not the case. You know, thousands of comic books are coming out every year to focus on, you know, deep subjects that propose new ideas, push audience to think differently. And, you know, I personally become, you know, continue to get educated by comic books and comic authors. So um, if you think comics are just mindless reads for entertainment, you're just, you know, really haven't been paying attention. Um, okay, another very common concern, which I just heard from a parent just last week, um, is if a young child is only exposed to books with pictures, they won't be able to use their own imaginations when they read literary novels. So I think this is a really interesting idea, um, is reading the only way to build strong imagination. So Sarah Maxine Green is, the, is a world-renowned pioneer uh, in education, and she would disagree with that statement. So she associates imagination with perception, she says, the more we can actively and interestedly perceive, the wider becomes the field on which our imaginations work. So she emphasized the importance of music, dance, theater, and visual arts with helping to develop strong imaginations. So in other words, the more we can take in with our senses, the better our imaginations work. Um, and according to the research, a strong imagination, you know, as well as better literacy, is reliant on something called multimodality. And so the that's the application of multiple literacies in one medium. So a perfect example of that is a uh, live weather forecast. So just to explain what multimodality is real quick. So at first glance, this looks really simple, right? It's just a normal web weather forecast we've seen. But there's actually a ton going on here. So um, first of all, there's the screen that you're looking at it on. Then there's the spoken language of the meteorologist you're listening to. Then you've got the written language descriptions on the screen, and then you've got the weather icon imagery, uh, the animated symbols to interpret. And so you're using all your imagination to interpret all this information in a sequence to decide what you're gonna do for your day. Um, so there's multiple literacies at play here. Um, and if you haven't noticed, it pretty much looks like a comic. It even has a punchline. <laughs> So while literary novels uh, require readers to use their imagination with one modality, the printed word, graphic narratives are a multi-modality art form. So readers are required to perceive and interpret everything from the printed word to images, visual cues, and symbols. And readers also have to use their imaginations to decide you know, what is happening between the panels. Um, so the spaces in between the panels of a comic book is called the gutters, and to me, you know, that's where almost like most of the story happens between the panels, right? It's you're using your imagination, the reader has to fill in the gaps of what's happening. Um, and another opportunity for readers to use their imagination is on the images themselves. And this is a good example of that. 
um, you know, how, how, why is an author representing their ideas visually in, in this way and conceptualizing, conceptualizing those ideas um, for the reader to interpret? So, and then sometimes there's authors are so, <laughs> they create work that's so layered and complex that it can take multiple reads to understand, you know, what is everything that's going on. Um, this is a spread from one of my favorite um, sequential artists, Chris Ware, who uses panel orientation um, to create tension, pacing. He balances, you know, from time periods with visual cues, uses icons and typography, um, you know, to put emphasis on things. Um, so I'm not worried at all about young readers who decide to tackle the complexity of comics. Um, honestly, uh, when I was making this talk, I started being a little more concerned about kids who aren't reading comics or some form of sequential art because here's a quote from um, here's a quote from a, an article in the Journal of Adolescent um, Literacy so the world is becoming multi multimedia oriented every day more and more whether you like it or not and so those of us who aren't ready for that could be left behind you know and you know I know a lot of extremely well-read people who really seem to struggle with the visual literacy. Um, I see kind of their brains almost seem to kind of shut down when they're trying to make sense of images like this. Um, and when we're faced with new visual languages, you know, these same, pe same people can feel overwhelmed and lost and un unable to problem solve. So comics can, I think, can help with that. So sequential art is not only just a great way to strengthen your imagination, but it's also a great way to build on multiple forms of literacy. So yeah, so I really enjoyed discussing topic of comics with parents and trying to understand their concerns, but no matter what, there's some people who just don't agree that comic books shouldn't be taken seriously, and that's just fine. Um, this wouldn't be the first time there is like, you know, a group of people who don't take and underst they don't understand our art form, form completely. So I'll just ask you, this group, um, a question that relates to this. Can you think of another art form in history that was not widely accepted at first? Anybody? Novel. Novel. Cartoons. Cartoons. Probably most of them. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Uh, so here's a few of the most famous fine art examples I just through together, so movements that were at first pushed to the side or flat out angered the public. Um, and you know, it made me think, like what you just said, you know, is that what makes art, art? Like, does, in order for an art form to be viewed as important, um, does it have to go against the status quo? And this is definitely the case with music. Uh, it's hard not to think of a music genre that wasn't frowned upon when it first started to gain steam. Um, and I remember when I was a teenager, um, the first parental advisory stickers started coming out on, on CDs. And uh, I have the strong memory of my dad. I was watching MTV, my dad walks in, and he's just like, this is a fad. You know, this is clear. He was clearly super confused, uh, maybe even a little angry about what he was seeing on TV. This obviously just made me love the music even more. Um, uh, and I wasn't the only one. Turns out this was not a fad. This looks pretty familiar, right? Um, to the other uh, graph we had about comics. So, so, and then what about today? So, uh, there are plenty of new emerging art forms that are hard for people to get their head around, um, and or people just don't, they just don't think it's a valid form of expression. And um, so the first thing that came to my mind was video games. So, for people like me who, you know, generation who grew up playing video games, it's easy for me to see gaming as like a pretty valid powerful storytelling medium. This is uh, The Last of Us video game, which pretty much everybody's heard of by now. Um, the game was so influential that it's been made into, you know, award-winning TV series. Uh, the other thing I thought of was street art. So this used to be thought of as vandalism, straight up, just no, no questions about that. But now street art can be, you know, considered an art form that is socially acceptable and fully respected in some areas. Um, so now works from artists like Banksy, which is shown here, um, you know, are world renowned. There are plenty of other emerging mediums that we could discuss that I'm str struggling to get my head around uh, and understand, but they're definitely going to keep coming. And, um, you know, that makes me wonder about the future of comics uh, and what we can expect kind of moving forward. Um, so, just like all the other art forms we discussed, 
we're coming face to face with like this new evolution evolution of art making, um, which is artificial intelligence. So, you know, I'm sure you can play with the tools, and they're sometimes they're not quite that impressive. I I just typed in um, to chat chat GPT to come up with a story for a, a comic book. Um, the title alone is pretty cringy. Um, you know, it's just this whole thing was just it's really interesting. It's like filled with cliche, spits out just this derivative stuff. But you know, it's getting better every day, and you know, there are already comics coming out that have been fully drawn by AI. So this is an example of a story that was written by an artist um, who then used AI to generate the artwork, and it's like really, really impressive. Um, but there's some serious, serious resistance. So publishers across the board have a very clear message right now. No AI-generated rated art uh, are allowed in any submissions. And we all re recently witnessed um, the writer's strike, you know, which was centered around protecting writers from this kind of technology. So is AI something we should be worried about? That's like that whole other talk that I'm not going to do and get into. But um, you know, as history has shown us, you know, resistance is futile. Um, so maybe AI can just be another tool that artists like me can use to, you know, to utilize and, and evolve with it, or the machines are just going to wipe us all out. This is, you know, in the world of comics, this is not a new philosophical question by any means. Um, the consequences of AI is a topic that has been well researched and addressed in comic books for a really, really long time. So now that we've covered um, kind of where comics come from and what comics are, um, and maybe dispelled some of the myths, uh, I wanted to just take a few minutes and walk through why I choose to work in the medium of comics. Um, and uh, some of the things that make it such you know, a unique storytelling medium. So when I was a kid, I used to um, love grabbing the newspaper, reading the funnies. I was completely obsessed. You know, I even loved reading the ones I didn't understand. It was just, they were super intriguing to me. Um, you know, I just loved looking at all the different art styles and baffled by how artists could come up with new ideas every day. Um, at the time, I thought that the point of comic strips were just kind of for a clever gag, you know, but little did I know, a lot of the comics I was reading were addressing you know, much deeper topics than I was aware of. And it wasn't until I was much older that I realized some of my favorite artists had an underlying commentary in their work. So when I was a kid, I spent a lot of time learning to draw my favorite cartoon characters, and eventually I started coming up with my own. Um, this is the first comic I got published in my school newspaper. It's sort of, it's hard for me to look at, honestly, some, in some ways, but I'll never forget, you know, that feeling of how great it felt to have my artwork, like, in print for the first time. Um, and when I showed my work to my parents, you know, they were pretty supportive, but, but my dad was, like, a classically trained fine artist. And so he totally encouraged my cartooning, but he also pushed me to explore, you know, drawing and painting. And my dad would often take me on trips to Seattle galleries, and I became pretty inspired. And I click, quickly learned that fine art was, you know, a much more respective art form than cartooning was. So I started getting serious. I put some of my portfolio together, and I headed off to art school to become a real artist. And uh, it was a great experience. I gained a lot of skills um, and learned a ton of disciplines. But every once in a while, I, um, I'd find myself, you know, like kind of rolling my eyes a little bit. There was kind of this kind of pretentious vibe surrounding everything. And, um, you know, it was like we were in this secret club for artsy educated people or something. And so slowly but surely, I kind of just gravitated back to comics and animation. And I'm really glad I did. So um, I love working in this medium because, you know, first of all, comics are for everybody. So instead of art that's closed off in this expensive gallery that can only be owned by the rich elite, um, comics are cheap to buy and produce and distribute, and they can, you know, get important ideas out to many different demographics, which is something that, you know, a lot of art forms have trouble with. So comics are for everybody. And on the flip side, everyone can make comics. So, you know, you might think, you know, you need, you know, the really high quality materials or, you know, ex professional equipment to make comic, comic books. But, you know, the fact is all you need is, you know, a pen and a paper and you have the same materials at your disposal that created some of the greatest works in history. And think about the millions of dollars and hundreds of people and special effects needed to pull off an action sequence in a film. Um, 
I love the fact that as an artist, I can create an epic sequence right from my drawing desk without any cost at all. And not to mention, instead of um, hiring an Oscar-winning actor to perform the lead in my story, I can create my own characters uh, for free and get them to do whatever I want. So com comics are also for artists of all skill levels. Um, so you don't have to be an artistic genius to create compelling work. Um, some of my favorite books have been by artists who focus on story in a simple original style. Um, you know, I'll take a great story with minimal artwork over a bad story with overblown visuals any day. Um, so another reason I love this medium is, it, you know, working in commerce offers some really, really creative, you know, unique creative freedoms. So there are some things you can do in comics that you just really cannot do in other mediums. Um, here's an example of that. So this is a spread from a comic book. Um, and what we're looking at here is three separate narratives from three separate time periods happening in one physical environment. So if we take out the color, you can see this whole page is showing like one large room from one vantage point. It's just broken up into panels, but it's just one scene. And if we add the colors back in and focus on three, there's three different stories playing out. You know, the, the yellow panels show this kind of daytime interaction of, at the museum with some planning going on. Uh, the red panels show a crime being committed, and then the blue panels, we see an after-hours investigation of the crime. Um, so it's a really imaginative way to you know, present different stories lining up after, uh, like, that overlap each other. Uh, here's a couple more examples of this similar technique. Um, you know, one larger view of an environment with the panels broken up to highlight different action moments. Um, so yeah, another really cool example of something you can do. Um, okay, so yeah, another example of something you can do in comics that you can't uh, do elsewhere is, uh, so this is a story where, this is the story where Batman is trapped in this labyrinth, okay? And he's disoriented and super lost, and as you can see in the panels at the right, um, the, the orientation of the panels have changed, which makes the reader have to physically rotate the comic book to read it. Um, and as the story progresses and Batman gets more confused and lost and starts to kind of lose touch with reality, um, the book has to be rotated several times as you're reading it, you know, and also the panels start to, you know, take on different shapes, which reinforce Batman's kind of reality starting to fall apart. Um, so I thought this was a really groundbreaking approach to telling the story. So yeah, so there's many examples of this, of storytelling techniques that are, you know, only possible in the world of comic books, which I think is pretty cool. Okay, so the other big reason uh, why I choose to work in comics is I'm really interested in creating in different mediums. You know, I don't want to be stuck to just doing one thing all the time. And with comics, you don't have to just stick to one discipline. You know, I get to work with many different art forms simultaneously. So. On one hand, I get to do what I love the most, which is draw. So the basic principles I learned at, at school and art school still apply. But I also get to write and tell stories, um, do research, create story arcs. And to top it all off, I get to utilize some of the principles of filmmaking. So if I think of my project as you know, a cinematic work, it helps me get perspective on my projects, like a new perspective, um, you know, creating things like, you know, the viewpoint from camera angles, like, and timing and pacing and visual cues, these are all, you know, things that apply to comic books. And when each of these disciplines overlap, there's, you know, we find even more opportunities to explore through the art of comics. Uh, things like typography, setting, visual style, um, they're all essential ingredients to a successful comic. So yeah, so I could go on and on about what makes comics such a unique storytelling uh, medium and you know, the many reasons why I love to work in comics. But the main goal of this talk was to look at the art form of comics from a new perspective. And you know, to show that comic books have a very interesting, unique history and that comics can in fact be a powerful educational tool uh, that can prepare kids for a rapidly changing future. And so for those in the audience who haven't, you know, ever had the opportunity to read a comic book, uh, maybe the next time you find yourself at the bookstore or the library, um, you can do yourself a favor and head over to the comic book and graphic novel section, give it a chance. Um, so before we wrap up, uh, I 
just, you know, since I've spent the last, you know, 30 minutes or so talking about comic books, uh, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about my own graphic novel. Um, so we are not strangers. Uh, so I want to share how this book came to be, a little bit about the process of creating it. Um, so this project started with a story that my uncle shared with me about attending his grandfather's funeral. And it was a typical Jewish event, you know, cl close family, friends, relatives he hadn't seen in years, tons of familiar fa faces. But there were some people he didn't recognize at all. So a handful of Japanese American guests began to arrive and no one knew who they were or why they came. And what my uncle found out <clears throat> is that his grandfather had helped these families when they were forced out of the neighborhood and incarcerated during World War II. So the story only took a few minutes to tell, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, I was asking myself, like, how does a Jewish immigrant with family still overseas threatened by the Holocaust end up helping out his Japanese and American neighbors here at home? Um, so I went back to interview my uncle, and I started writing and putting some rough sketches together. Um, and as I started to research the details, the story kind of began to grow, and I started to discover some other similar stories. Um, stories about the Cent Seattle Central District, which um, was the neighborhood where my family, which uh, were Sephardic Jews who were from the Mediterranean, they settled there. And this was a neighborhood where minorities and immigrants <clears throat> who were blocked from living elsewhere could kind of call their home and get to know each other um, as friends and neighbors. And so I met with historians at University of Washington and um, you know, learned more about my own family history um, and I connected with Dencho, which is the Japanese incarceration archive based in Seattle. Um, and suddenly this project kind of turned into this giant research project. Uh, next thing I knew, I was kind of interviewing rabbis on the daily, meeting with Japanese woodblock print gallery owners, and sitting down for poke bowls with fishermen. Um, and as I interviewed people, I started to learn about you know, other stories of caretakers who helped out their Japanese American neighbors during the war at that time. And I started learning about historical landmarks that I could kind of include in my story. Um, so this is Washington Hall, which was, uh, it's still there. It's a historic public dance and music hall, which was the settlement place and gathering place for um, a lot of immigrant cultures. Uh, I also used a lot of reference material and photos I found online to create stuff. Um, I started compiling images to draw from uh, when creating my scenes. And the more I kind of like, immersed myself in these different environments, I was able to create the settings of the story. Uh, and I looked at a lot of old pictures, um, some from old family photos and others from, that I found from the time period, which I used to create the characters in the story. Um, yeah, and, but every once in a while, I'd have an idea for a character pose you know, that I couldn't find a reference for. I like to really, obviously, use a lot of reference material. Um, so I have trouble visioning, visioning stuff in my head sometimes, and so I have my family pose for me. Um, so I wanted to show you a couple of these photos just about my process. Um, my family's kind of constantly subjected me coming in with an idea and getting them into some strange pose. Um, I take their pictures to draw from. A lot of times um, I'll, have, I'll come back in and make them pose again from a different angle. Uh, a lot of times I make them use props. Um, and they have no context for what is going on or what's happening or why. But I wanted to show this. It's nice to have live-in, uh, you know, reference models in my house. It makes my job a lot easier. Um, so in the same way that I rely on reference material for the artwork, that's the same went for my story and my, my scenes. So I wanted, you know, really wanted all the things that happened to my characters to come from, um, you know, true stories or anecdotes I picked up in the way, you know, in, in research and archives. Um, and so, yeah, just to show a little bit more about my process, you know, once I finished my rough storyline uh, with narration and dialogue um, and all my artwork notes, I move on to storyboarding. Um, so I lay out, you know, initial storyboards for my project. Um, I've learned that saves me a lot of time. You know, this allows me to figure out, you know, the full page layout um, and, you know, where I want to go f instead of, you know, drawing a bunch and then having to scrap stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, once my storyboards are complete, uh, I, I start moving on to the pencil work. And to me, this is, you know, this is the fun part. I just kind of sketch different ideas and um, just imagine different ways to create my scenes that way. Um, and using my reference materials, you know, when needed. 
Um, and then after my pencils are co complete, um, you know, we move on to the inking and coloring process. Um, so one other cool thing I wanted to mention about this book is I learned, you know, so much during the process of making it. And um, when my publisher, like I was telling them about it, they agreed to conclude a lot of the research I did in the back matter, which is a really cool resource for people who want to dive deeper into the history. Um, and for teachers, there's also an accompanying, accompanying education guide. Um, so for, for teachers who want to, you know, use We Are Not Strangers in their curriculum. Um, so yeah, if that's uh, just another bonus. Um, so yeah, through a lot of research and collaboration, I uh, ended up weaving together, you know, the oral histories of a lot of people to kind of create this story about allyship. Um, so We Are Not Strangers is this story about the strong connection between these two communities that just isn't really well known. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited to share it with you all after afterwards if you're interested. And um, yeah, so and I've showed a little bit about my process creating this, but there are so many ways about to go about creating comics. This is just my way. Um, if you're really interested <clears throat> in learning more, um, I recommend these resources. They're great. Tips and tricks of the trade uh, to explore. You know, from artists who have dedicated their life to kind of documenting how to you know, their storytelling techniques. Um, and I also brought a ton of uh, example books with me today, uh, if you're interested in checking those out. Um, but yeah, thank you again all so much for coming and really appreciate it. product and say this is it you know take it or leave it or like how does that work because obviously there's like a lot that goes into every panel and sure I'm, I've always been kind of curious about that yeah I I was really curious too when I started it was kind of like why well, don't I don't have any information about this yeah. <laughs> um, and I think you know there isn't really a standard way to go about I with with this book um, I I went pretty far with it before I I, I wanted to find an agent first. And so as I was doing that, I was getting rejected constantly. And so I just kept working on my book. And by the time I found an agent that believed in what I was doing, um, I was pretty far along. And I, in my mind, I was like, this will land, even if it's, I can publish it somewhere tiny. You know, I was just like, I really want to get this idea out there. Um, so that, a little of that delusion, I think, helps just to work hard, you know, but, um, now that I've gotten this done, I, and I've talked to other artists, I think that there's also a really standard way to go about it is to have a pitch. And so it's like a very small you know, synopsis of your story, a rough outline, and then some example pages. Um, and I think that can save artists a lot. It would have saved me a lot of time in the past of so working on projects that they weren't going to go anywhere. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a good standard way to just kind of get feedback before you go too far. If it's, but, and let, but if you, I will say, if you believe in what you're doing and you work hard and you love it, just keep going without having to work on, the, you know, think about that, because that can get in the way, you know. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. It, it, I, it does, <laughs> I, I remember reading about one of, one of the graphic novels that I've read, and I can't remember which one it was, but that um, the publisher like didn't like his main character's nose, and he had to like, go through and like, redraw everything to have a different nose, and I just thought, how frustrating <laughs> that must be, so I was just kidding. I mean, it's kind of, I had to redraw a lot yeah. when I got a, a publisher, yeah. And I made one mistake, which was, yeah, I don't, do you know what bleeds are? So I, I didn't calculate my bleeds well mm -hmm. on the side. If bleeds are you drawing to the edges of your artwork so that when they trim it, you, the artwork goes to the sides. So I had to go, all my, all my panels that went past the edges, I had to go in and just do the little, expand them out. That was so annoying, right? <laughs> but um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, Charlie, like if for any writer, there's an editing process and you have to go through and we're like, change the tense of something or do something like that. That's just like this grunt work thing. That's just part of the deal, so. Yeah. You mentioned a little bit about like your interest in animation, and I'm just curious if you're kind of like also doing or like have been doing or also like um, looking at like do, going beyond the page and also oh. like doing an actual animation. Yeah, um, I actually so uh, when I got graduated, um, 
college, I worked as an animator for a while. That's kind of what I thought I was going to do. Um, and I worked as an animator for a bit, and I quickly got kind of burned out on it. Um, I really appreciate animation. I love it so much. It can be really satisfying, but it is really grueling. And so maybe someday I could get back into it. Um, but I kind of feel like I'm going to leave it to people who know what they're doing and spent more time on it. But why are you into animation? Well, I'm a filmmaker. So oh, yeah, like, okay. Outside my work, so I'm yeah. just, like, interested about, like, you know, from page to, to yeah. see, like, how, you know, it, yeah. it, it clearly connects with, with your book, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I love the graphic novel or comic book adaptations that turn into animation and how they tackle that differently. It's pretty fun to watch. Uh, you mentioned some of the most important parts of the narrative exist in the gutters. How do you decide which parts of the story should be visualized and which you should leave to the reader's imagination? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, I think, for me, I think um, that kind of happens in the storyboarding process for me. So like, I, I, when I write, and I'm sure every artist is different, I, I just recently did a talk with MS Harkness, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but I'm just baffled by her because she just she literally just draws from the left side to the right and she just doesn't look back and she, that's how she creates her work it's just like wow her brain just is totally different I need to plan stuff out um, but yeah I, I write stuff down and I when I write I write like with images along the way just kind of description of images and then as I'm storyboarding sometimes I, I've I realize that the you know there's too much image here, or, or I need to just take one out, or something like that. So I think in that process, it just kind of is clear. I I don't know. I think for me, one of the biggest things is um, how to explain this. Like, I like when the image isn't kind of explaining what this, the words are. So if the words are saying something and the image is the same thing, that doesn't need an image, or vice, or it doesn't need the words. Right? So it's kind of like editing the, one of those out. I appreciate that. Like sometimes I read work and you're like, you're, you're getting told too much. You know, I like to leave. So that's a good example of like, oh, that'll go in the gutter. They don't need to see that. You know? I don't know. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mason and I'm here at the Liberty Park Library. We hope you come by and visit us sometime and see all that we have going on. You're watching City Cable 5.